Uh, domestic politics. Um, the, uh, arguably, the presidency rose and fell in a lot of ways on, on foreign policy, but that does not mean that domestic policy is unimportant. In fact, Katrina, we've already alluded to the role of that. And I think 20, 30 years down the road, some of the domestic policy programs put in now may be maybe what, what moves Bush a little higher in the rankings than he other, otherwise would be, although, it's, although we'll see how history judges that. Uh, at any rate, we have three outstanding scholars here. Um, uh, Rick Hess at American Enterprise Institute couldn't be here, but we do have um, uh, his co-author Patrick McGuinn from Drew University, who has a wonderful book called NCLB uh, about uh, NCLB and the, the revolution in education policy, published two years back, right, by the University Press of Kansas. Um, we have Ann Kadimian from Virginia Tech, a wonderful public administration scholar who has published more books than I can count, I think, all, all of them quite good, a wonderful book called Working with Culture that I, I reviewed a few years back. Uh, on how to change organizations. And my, uh, my former colleague from my time here at Villanova, uh, Laura Brown, who's done some, some wonderful work on who runs for office and how, particularly presidential aspirants. And uh, she is going to start us off with a book on partisan realignment under President Bo uh, an article, a, ch a book chapter, Partisan Realignment Under President Books, Bush, titled Reactionary Ide Ideologues and Uneasy Partisans, Bush and Party Realignment. And with that, let me turn it over to Laura Brown. Thank you, Bob. Thanks so much. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. This is uh, wonderful to be at my fairly new home university, um, having an opportunity to talk about President Bush and be here in the company of so many really wonderful scholars and colleagues that I admire. Um, so today, what I really hope to do was to have a chance, obviously, to look at President Bush from a very political perspective. Um, I actually am greatly appreciative of uh, Dr. Dulia's uh, comments at lunch because it sort of sets up this conversation, I think, rather nicely. Um, I do look at um, President Bush in this format of competence and especially within a sense of political um, competence that has been the outline for this book. But I also took the liberty, um, as some of us scholars are known to do, to redefine um, strategic, tactical, and moral competence with respect to partisanship. So what I was looking at was essentially how does President Bush and his political team, which obviously was uh, led by Karl Rove, essentially how did they work to reshape this political regime, try to foster a realignment, and why I use realignment is really because I think it was a goal that they set for themselves and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but then also look at it in terms of the strategic and tactical and moral senses and how they relate to this political confidence. So I put up here how um, on this PowerPoint slide that I essentially um, sort of added in a partisan um, or a party component to each one of these other definitions. And with that, I'm going to start um, really at the beginning. Because one of the things that I think is interesting about politics is you can't take it out of its time. Um, politics is absolutely embedded in the moment in which those political instances are happening. Um, the opportunities and constraints that present themselves to partisans uh, really are there to be exploited or um, ignored or neglected. And Unfortunately, if you try to write a more parsimonious narrative, which is very helpful for our field, political scientists like simple models, um, you usually miss actually the dynamics of what was going on. So much of this um, has a sense of a chronological sort of marching through history. Um, but again, I think that that fits with an understanding of how politics works. So let me just begin by saying that I, I very much believe that uh, President Bush believed he was a compassionate conservative. I do not think that that is a construct, nor do I actually think that uh, President Clinton's new democratic ideology is simply a political construct. These are their philosophies of how they actually view politics and really what I would consider to be the big political question, which is how big should government be? which has sort of defined our entire government um, and really our politics for all of our nation's history. So my, my analysis 
says that basically Bush and his political team sort of set as their political goal to restructure this political regime. They hoped, they wanted to, they believed that compassionate conservatism would be the basis upon which they would do this. And then I come to the conclusion over the course of this entire thing that basically they were too political in this sense that they were so proficient at politics that they ended up creating a very strident opposition and they ended up with a backlash. So there is an irony to the fact that maybe you don't always want to be successful in politics in such a polarized time. Um, kind of something along the lines of Newton's law of thermodynamics. So let me just um, sort of mention something about compassionate conservatism because I think uh, it is incredibly important. David Brooks, uh, back in 2004, wrote a really wonderful uh, New York Times Magazine sort of long think piece about how the Republicans um, are trying to reinvent themselves. And he talked about compassionate conservatism. And he explained that Bush's compassionate conservatism was not the small government states' rights philosophy of Reagan. And he went on to say that Bush understood that the simple government is the problem philosophy of the older Republicans was obsolete. And that the paradox that he understood was that if you do not have a positive vision of government, you won't be able to limit the growth of it. In other words, if you don't know what you don't want it to do, you certainly um, cannot sort of come to a sense of what it should do. And and I think that if you look at Bush, one of the things that's fascinating is he did have a very positive vision of government. In fact, he believed that government should institutionalize conservative principles, such as things like fostering more competition in education using um, such policy tools as vouchers, protecting um, life by promoting both abstinence education and limiting access to stem cells, ensuring an ample supply of labor by encouraging immigration. And he also wanted to give people more of a choice in directing their investments in Social Security because he believed that that freedom to do that was fundamentally a part of conservatism. Um, obviously, for a time, the compassionate conservative mantra works well. And I do think that um, Professor Dulia is right in the sense that there were many things that actually started to take place prior to 9-11. Um, there was this sort of movement of the domestic policy agenda in particular toward you know, the faith-based um, initiative, toward um, the education, uh, which eventually became No Child Left Behind. But there was a great deal of activity on um, these levels prior to 9-11. Then, of course, um, this world did turn upside down. And I, and I don't think, um, and I'm completely in, in agreement with Professor Galston on this, there, there's just, there's no way you can understand Bush without understanding both the political opportunities that this horrific event brought, and as well as the constraints that it started to limit um, some of the ways in which he was defined as a president. Um, so, as 9-11 happens, um, there is this sort of amazing spirit of bipartisanship. Um, and it, it appears to be moving um, many of the policy agendas forward in the administration. People believe that, um, that government might actually work. In fact, in 2002, not only um, was there the, the push toward No Child Left Behind, but of course, bipartisan campaign finance reform also uh, gets um, passed. And, if, and as you start to move toward those midterm elections, um, the Democrats were trying very, very hard to associate Bush and the Republicans with things like Enron and the financial collapse that happened in that um, place. And one of the other things that the Democrats tried to do um, was to frame the restructuring of the Department of Homeland Security, what was originally um, Governor Ridge's sort of czar role on Homeland Security, which eventually became a department. The Democrats were trying to make that seem as though Bush was being political, and in fact, it essentially backfired. Um, 
many more people believed uh, that, that in fact the Democrats were being political in trying to ensure that the Department of Homeland Security had union workers and the like. Um, so as this, this world turns upside down, um, the Republicans actually come out on top, in part because of obviously Bush's approval rating, which goes back to that sense of a rally around the flag and all that was moving forward. On election night itself, um, the Republicans actually picked up six seats in the House, two seats in the Senate, and um, with that Senate, it obviously returned majority control to the Republicans. One of the other things um, that I think is important is that amidst this um, sort of outward appearance of bipartisanship, there were some, some changes and some policies that were absolutely directed to favor the Republicans, namely the tax cut bill. And there was quite um, a tussle over tax cuts, which had led um, in part to Jeffords actually leaving the Republican Party and becoming an independent. In fact, he was one of the key people in um, those debates and had brought about some of that compromise. So I thought I'd put up here, um, hopefully you can see it, a chart of um, the Gallup approval rating. And this is what's so fascinating about this Gallup approval rating is that it talks about essentially President Bush's um, approval by party affiliation. The top line um, are the Republicans, the middle line are the independents, and the bottom line are the Democrats. Um, one of the things that I think few people appreciate is that in the 2004 election, um, Bush had already long lost the Democrats. He had essentially lost the Democrats between the 2002 election and between 2004. What you see is them um, coming markedly down um, below that 50% approval rating. Um, and by the time of 2004, uh, they don't like him. They are really ready to elect Kerry. For the independents, however, there's um, a different story. The independents, while they are sort of tracking along with the um, Democrats, they are also generally more uh, favorably disposed toward Bush. And then, of course, the Republicans stick with him incredibly loyally, partly because President Bush is also loyal to them. And this is something that happens as we start to move into um, sort of this 2003-2004 period, is that right just before um, um, the, the, the election, obviously, in, in 2002, Bush had essentially cornered the Democrats on the, how, on the vote for the Iraq War, on the authorization for the Iraq War. This essentially cornered many Democrats. Many Democrats felt that they had to go along with it. They voted with um, the authorization for the use of force, even if they were a little concerned by it, um, because they were so worried it was going to come back to bite them in 2002. Uh, it didn't, but it started to come back to bite them come 2004, and I think um, we can certainly see that in the 2008 nomination race, it was one of the largest motivating um, issues that kept driving those differences um, and the fight, really, between uh, the different nominees. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me just say one other thing about this 2004 cycle, is it as these re-election um, politics continued, um, Bush kept sort of pushing tax cuts, kept serving um, essentially a Republican base, and, um, and in addition, he also um, passed the Medicare Prescription Drug Act um, in late December of 2003, which again, um, while most Republicans were not all that excited about it, because it was an expansion of government. At the same time, um, it looked to be something that they were going to be able to offer to seniors, which would be part of growing the Republican uh, coalition. So then we look at um, what happens in 2005. And this is where all of this political proficiency 
really starts to come back on Bush. Like I said, before he had lost the Democrats. In 2004, he was still splitting with Kerry um, the independents, but by 2005, the independents start saying, um, this is not my person. Now, President Bush, his electoral coalition in 2004 was incredibly interesting in that he did close the gender gap partially. Um, in fact, Kerry earned about 51% of uh, the women's vote. Uh, President Bush earned 48%. That was a significantly smaller gender gap than either um, Gore or uh, what Clinton had actually enjoyed. And President Bush had earned 44% um, of, of the Hispanic vote. Um, these pictures are actually taken at the Cinco de Mayo celebration in 2005 at the White House. Um, in fact, all the pictures on this PowerPoint slide um, were taken from the White House uh, website. But I think what is interesting is how much President Bush wanted to lead off sort of with these notions of immigration reform, with this notion of expanding this Republican uh, coalition. And again, um, this is not a small government or states rights type of uh, leadership. One of the things um, he does pass in, um, in 2005, which is a surprise um, to most people, was actually that they pass a, um, a tax, not, not just a tax decrease, but they also pass a tort reform um, bill. What I would argue is that by the time um, Hurricane Katrina hits in late September, Bush was already politically vulnerable. The Terry Schiavo case had happened, um, and there was already that sense that he was out of touch. Um, there were notions about Jack Abramoff, the Abramoff scandal that were already sort of coming to the fore. So there were questions about his moral um, leadership, in other words, how he won and how he was continuing to lead on things like Social Security, which were all coming into essentially a confluence by the time um, Katrina hit in September. Um, and this is a quote, and I'm not sure why the slide got messed up, but this is a quote of President Bush where he basically said, you know, I earned capital in the campaign and I'm going to spend it. And that was the notion that he went into the Social Security debate with, and I think it came back and bit him. Um, by the time of the 2006 elections, obviously, there, there is now, he's lost the independence, the um, Republicans are starting to essentially move away from him as well, partly because of all of these sort of big government type of policies that he has passed, and, um, and then obviously the continuing stalemate um, on the Iraq war, and the fact that even with the midterm elections, even with um, things turning over, nothing happens. Um, I think one of the things that's so shocking is that even after the Democrats actually win back the Congress in what was a very surprising midterm election to uh, most um, Republicans especially, who thought that they would hold their own, um, there was a Wall Street Journal article that said, quote, barring a burst of legislative activity after Labor Day, this group of 535 men and women will have accomplished a rare feat in two decades of record keeping, no sitting Congress has passed fewer public laws at this point in the session. So clearly, by the time we end up, you know, at the 2008 election, I mean, I don't think that there's much surprise for the fact that you end up with a huge backlash. So when you evaluate kind of overall Bush's political legacy, what you notice is they're extraordinarily um, sort of successful, both legislatively and politically and electorally, um, in those first four or five years. And in 2005, everything starts to come unraveled. All of the stridency, all of the stubbornness, all of the pushing to make sure that they win started to come back on them. And, and it started to hurt them from a moral standpoint. So, when I look at that, I would say that the biggest problem for Bush, and I think overall his um, sense 
of, of what that legacy is, is that it's mixed. It's mixed, right? Much like what my other colleagues have said, there, there is a way in which he ends up being his own worst enemy, partly because um, everybody else, his opponents in a democratic system, start to uh, come back and fight against him. So thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, it is wonderful to be here. Uh, in my case, it's uh, sort of particularly meaningful to be back at Villanova. My father attended undergraduate and law school here, so it's great to be back. Thanks to Bob and all the other uh, organizers for the uh, conference and the invitation, and also thanks to my co-author, Rick Hess, uh, who couldn't be here um, today. Um, you know, as we talk about uh, No Child Left Behind in, in this paper as a way to sort of understand uh, part of his domestic legacy, we're going from sort of the macro presented by, by Laura a little bit down to the individual policy uh, arena here and talking about education. Um, it's enormously um, complex uh, law, obviously a little bit um, mysterious, uh, highly charged, very controversial. Uh, obviously NCLB, I think many people here have already referenced this, um, is largely seen as, as one of, if not the uh, central domestic legislative achievement of the, of the Bush uh, era. Um, and uh, very much, uh, as we heard uh, at the lunch conversation, a centerpiece of his compassionate conservative um, philosophy. Um, and so I think it's a, it's, we can learn a lot about the Bush presidency um, and also about its legacy by looking at, at this particular um, law. Bush, in, in many ways, um, I think, can be seen as a real revolutionary um, in education uh, policy. And uh, for better or worse, this revolution that he helped to, to auger in, I think, will, will long outlive um, his administration. Now, I think the conventional wisdom about um, No Child Left Behind views this as sort of an unmitigated uh, policy uh, and political uh, failure on the part um, of the Bush administration. What, what Rick and I try to argue um, in this paper is that this legacy uh, is, as Laura said, much more mixed, I think, potentially, and much more uh, complicated. In particular, we think that there are two very different um, interpretations to, to take, uh, potentially, about No Child um, Left Behind. I, um, and we sort of frame this in the paper as sort of an, is an inspirational uh, act um, or an incoherent um, one. <laughs> um, and uh, first of all, I guess the skeptical view about um, No Child Left Behind, and this builds um, very much on Professor Giulio's um, Mayberry Machiavelli's. I think that's certainly one interpretation implemented. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, certainly it, it's a series of political compromises um, that in the skeptical view created uh, an unworkable and unpopular uh, policy. Um, I think there's a second view, though, one that hasn't really received sufficient uh, treatment in the media, certainly, and even in the, the scholarly um, literature that's maybe a bit more generous in looking, and, and I think it's law in a bit of a different um, light. In this view, um, NCLB um, was never just about sort of a, a policy remedy uh, designed to, 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 uh, to improve uh, education, although it certainly was that um, in part, but rather it was about trying to change the culture uh, of schooling in the United States, to actually change the conversation about uh, school reform and the politics um, around it. It was designed to spur um, innovation uh, as well as to bring about some long-term political um, benefits to the Republican um, Party. And I think one way to sort of understand what uh, the context within which the Bush administration was operating in education as well as the legacy as it, as it departed was to, to give a little bit of history here, not, not too much. I wrote a whole book on this. I won't bore you with all of that. Um, but it is important to sort of understand as they, as they exit um, how education policy and school reform uh, in the United States right now is remarkably different um, than it was at the, at the time when the administration uh, entered. Um, obviously, NCLB, since this is not an education, uh, a narrow education conference that we usually talk at, give a little bit of extra context. Uh, NCLB obviously is, a, is a, a reauthorization, the latest reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, right, which started in 1965, part of uh, LBJ's uh, Great Society connected to the, to the war on poverty. Um, it created really sort of the first sort of major federal uh, involvement in education, but it's really an involvement pretty prescribed around uh, targeting extra resources, money um, to disadvantaged uh, kids and disadvantaged uh, school districts. Um, there was no real um, focus on student achievement uh, or any kind of accountability, um, though, for, uh, for poor performance of, of schools or students um, attached to that uh, act. You know, you get 
20 years, more or less, not too much change uh, in, the, in the central tenets of the policy. 1983, a lot of you are familiar, Nation at Risk really begins to change uh, kind of the discourse uh, about education policy in the United States and what the federal role uh, should be. Um, 1994, I just learned Laura was a part of this uh, uh, discussion, administration in the, in the Clinton Department of Education. You get um, an Improving America's School Act and Goals 2000, which are two major education pieces of legislation out of the, out of the Clinton era. Now, um, the fact that probably none of you, uh, unless you study education, have heard of the IASA or the Improving America's School Act tells you a little bit about its impact. Um, it didn't do a heck of a lot. Everybody knows NCLB, not too many people know IASA. But there were a lot of the, the, the legislative um, language, a lot of the um, uh, statutory kind of provisions that you actually see in NCOB are actually found in this uh, in IASA from 1994. But um, but Democrats don't really push the enforcement of this law um, too much. It's really more voluntary. There wasn't a sense that uh, the Department of Education was really going to withhold money from states um, that didn't comply fully to sort of voluntarily bring standards and testing uh, online. And in fact, most of them in the end um, didn't. You also, of course, had um, uh, almost immediately on the heels of the passage of these reforms in 94, uh, congressional takeover uh, of Congress as part of the Republican Revolution, the contract with America, uh, and the Republicans uh, Party in Congress at the time is very much opposed to uh, any federal role really in education um, whatsoever and views these um, 94 reforms that Clinton had passed um, with enormous um, skepticism. Um, and this provides, I think, the key point of contrast, right? So 1996, Bob Dole, a Republican nominee, runs for president on a, uh, on a campaign of eliminating the federal role in education completely. A part of the uh, Republican Party platform in that year calls for the abolition of the, of the Federal Department of Education. Um, and yet, uh, a mere four years later, right, we have George W. Bush running as the Republican nominee, uh, proposing during the campaign the largest expansion um, in the authority uh, of this very Department of Education um, that his own party had called to, to be abolished a mere four years um, earlier. So there's a, a major uh, shift. I think part of this can be explained um, by uh, politics. Um, you see a, a real partisan education gap that, that emerges uh, kind of throughout the 90s um, with Democrats having an enormous advantage. By 96, it's a 30 on the national agenda. By 96, it's seen as the number one or number two uh, uh, issue. And similarly, in 2000, it's seen as one of the C, uh, key uh, domestic uh, policy issues. So there's sort of a political response to this. Bush's uh, role as governor, as a you know, reform governor, education reform governor in uh, Texas, and its accountability system there is a key part of this too. Um, but in 2000, Bush calls for this much more aggressive uh, federal role. He very much uses the bully pulpit, uh, sort of the powers of the rhetorical uh, presidential candidate, uh, to talk about the soft bigotry of low expectations um, in education. Um, and uh, you know, again, linking this to his comp compassionate uh, conservative uh, philosophy, trying to appeal to, uh, to African Americans, in particular Latinos, um, in a way, and swing voters, um, in a way that Republicans had not been successful with in, in, in recent years. And it was a pretty successful uh, effort. It helped um, uh, uh, Bush eliminate that education gap, partisan education gap. Uh, and then that success, in turn, I think, helped him to kind of move the Republican Party. It was taking some steps in this direction after 96, before Bush, uh, but to embrace a, a more robust federal role in education. Or to put it a little bit differently, and I think Laura talked about this in terms of a, a Republican vision of a positive role um, for the federal government, rather than being opposed to things as they had been seen uh, throughout so much of the 1980s and 90s, uh, to, to argue about what they were for, in this case in education, um, trying to use federal power uh, in a way that they saw as being more, uh, more productive and more likely to generate real um, change. But Bush lays out this uh, ambitious agenda in 2000. But you know, again, the, you have to understand, I think everyone's been reiterating this, the, the, the place of the, of the particular president uh, in what, what Skronik would call political time, or other people would call uh, the regime cycle. Right? Obviously, 2000 election was rather close. Uh, Bush <laughs> certainly didn't em emerge with a real popular uh, mandate here. And, and the partisan balance in Congress was also extremely uh, close um, as well. And, and Bush made a crucial tactical choice at this moment. Um, he could have tried to sort of ram through a, a, a Republican-only party line vote, kind of conservative um, education reform package. In the end, he, he decides not to go that route, uh, but to pass push for a bipartisan uh, kind of bill with, uh, with NCLB. In part, this is because, uh, interestingly, Bush's, I think, position uh, is actually closer to the Democrats in Congress than it is to, to the Republicans. But as a consequence of this tactical choice, 
uh, Bush has to make a number of political compromises to get, uh, to get Democratic um, support. Um, most prominently has to give up vouchers, private school vouchers, which were a very prominent part of his original proposal and something that Republicans in Congress very much um, wanted to see. And he had to agree to much greater federal funding um, for education. Um, but you do get uh, bipartisan support, overwhelmingly bipartisan support in the Senate and the House, ultimately for NCLB. And you get a number of major uh, reforms that, that impact schooling. You get public school choice, uh, supplemental educational services, which are really amount to private school tutoring in the end, uh, annual testing, grades three through eight and once in high school. You get unprecedented kinds of a transparency uh, in terms of, of the data uh, that's now disaggregated by poverty, special, uh, 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 special education status, bilingual status, uh, and race and ethnicity, uh, which is really important. Then you get accountability tied to this in a pretty meaningful um, kind of, of, of way. And I think together these reforms have kind of profoundly changed um, education in the United States. But the key ultimately was going to be how these things were implemented. Um, and the trick for um, the Bush administration, I think, was twofold. One, um, you know, how hard do they, they push in the implementation? Um, particularly, there was a sense, as I alluded to earlier, that uh, the Clinton administration had, had put some reforms out there in 94, but for a variety of, of political and policy reasons, hadn't really um, enforced them too vigorously. Um, and, and, and as a result, those reforms hadn't had a great deal um, of impact. Given that the Bush, the whole uh, uh, sort of orientation of the administration was to use federal power to, to push change, um, they it, it decided to, to uh, implement this with great, uh, with great vigor and rigor. Um, and not surprisingly, um, you know, it generated an enormous amount of controversy. Um, and uh, and it, I think there's also a consensus it wasn't particularly implemented very well or effectively um, at, the same, um, at the same time. You get a backlash from the right, people arguing about limited government and federalism. You get a backlash from the left in terms of unions and the education establishment. And you get a lot of backlash from the states, Utah, Connecticut, and Virginia in particular. As Bush's popularity generally goes down, um, in large part to the uh, Iraq war and Katrina, but other things as well. NCLB gets tagged as a Bush law, um, uh, despite its connections to kind of Clinton's reforms earlier in the 90s, despite uh, the bipartisan support for it by the likes of Ted Kennedy and George Miller um, in Congress. Um, but interestingly, the pushback itself against the law kind of reveals how the politics of education has changed in the wake uh, of NCLB. And, and E. E. Schatzneider talks about how new policies create new politics. I think NCLB is a great example of that. Um, and you have this great moment earlier this year where you have something called the No Child Left Behind Recess Until Reauthorization Act, which is proposed, which basically would, would sort of halt uh, NCLB uh, uh, sanctions, accountability, until the law could be reauthorized. Um, but you see this interesting uh, pro-accountability alliance jump up to defend NCLB and say, no, we don't want to suspend uh, essentially the, the meaningful parts of the law. And this is in this interesting right-left coalition. You have business groups on the right, uh, but you also have Democrats like the Center for American Progress, the Democratic Leadership uh, Council, Democrats for Education Reform, uh, Education Equality Group, as well as the NAACP and the Leadership uh, Conference on Civil Rights. Um, you have this great moment where uh, in 2006, uh, 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 Connecticut files a lawsuit. Democratic Attorney General in Connecticut files a lawsuit against the Bush administration to suspend uh, uh, NCLB. And the NAACP sides with the Bush administration to defend uh, NCLB. It's a really kind of interesting moment. Um, and this reveals kind of a large, I think, and growing um, schism between uh, the unions, teachers unions, and civil rights groups over education reform, um, something that was on display uh, in the uh, Democratic Convention out in Denver. They had a rather public um, spat out there, um, which I think talks about how um, some of the politics has changed over, uh, over school reform. Let me wrap up um, by talking a little bit about the, the legacy of the Bush administration, summing all this up. I think for better or worse, uh, the Bush administration has changed um, the world of K-12 um, schooling, um, a number of important dimensions. It's institutionalized assessment um, and accountability and choice in education. You do have this unprecedented data uh, and transparency of school outcomes. Uh, you have Schumpeter's kind of creative destruction Right? Uh, you have these market forces in education, which have really expanded in recent years um, uh, with these alternative and entrepreneurial kinds of approaches, growth in charters, tutoring companies involved, non-traditional superintendents, uh, principals, and teachers, uh, and also, of course, the DC voucher program, which gets um, inaugurated in DC 
by Congress in the wake of NCLB. State departments of education have expanded their capacity, their efforts to oversee and intervene in schools. Uh, you have the reform of the Federal Department of Education, the shift from kind of being a grant-making institution to more of a compliance monitor, and enforcer, an agitator. You have a new Office of Educational uh, Innovation and Improvement there, Institute of Education Sciences, which is a more evidence-based reform kind of body than we've seen at the federal level. Um, and even despite all the calls for changes, um, uh, you know, the, the major Democratic candidates in the primary uh, all talked about how they embraced the goals of, of NCLB and the goals um, of accountability. Uh, you have a lot of reform-oriented Democratic mayors like Fenty and Booker and Klein, also uh, a lot of reform-oriented governors in the Democratic Party. Um, so I, I think one of the things we see in the presidential literature is that uh, Skoranek, again, talks about the presidency's efficacy as a, a battering ram, a sort of break down um, old uh, policies and old um, systems, but that it's less effective um, at building new systems to take, take their place. I think that's something that we're seeing um, here in the context uh, of NCLB. And then just to end, I think, um, you know, again, the, the educational conversation in the U.S. is markedly different um, than, it is, that, than it was before Bush took office. These fundamental assumptions about the purposes and potential of schooling, the political alliances that dominate reform efforts, um, and public and elite expectations about the role of the federal government have all changed uh, in important ways. Now, whether this will be good for school reform uh, or good for the Republican Party over the long term is not uh, yet clear. Um, I think answering such questions will depend on, on which ultimately proves more lasting. The cultural transformation pushed by the administration or the backlash, implementation headaches, and unanticipated consequences wrought by uh, NCLB. And much will depend on the degree to which the new president, uh, Obama, and the likely Democratic majorities now, now likely now confirmed uh, in the 111th Congress opt to build on this consensus that I do think exists and continues to exist. Um, in thanks, Bob, and thanks to everyone who's organized this conference. It's a delight to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I am not a presidential scholar. Uh, I study the bureaucracy uh, and public administration, and so my talk is really going to focus on issues of capacity and organizational capacity. Uh, John Dulio's wonderful talk uh, highlighted some of these capacity issues uh, that I'll talk a little bit more about. I think that focusing on the capacity of emergency relief in the Bush administration is a window to some of the other issues of bureaucratic and organizational capacity, too, that um, may be insightful for us uh, and, and help in that regard. Um, August 31st, 2008, the eve of the Republican National Convention, Hurricane Gustav is racing towards the Gulf Coast, and John McCain announces, quote, we take off our Republican hats and put on our American hats, and says we will scale back the Republican National Committee. It will not be the big party uh, because there are people in harm's way. Hurricane in question is still called Katrina, however, not Gustav. That this was really about uh, trying to uh, not put themselves in a position that they were with respect to Katrina, with respect to public opinion, not being prepared, celebrating when a hurricane is perhaps coming in. Um, the president was very attentive uh, as, as Gustav was coming in. Chertoff was very attentive. Lots of public attentive attentiveness, um, lots of media attention focused on the response of McCain, the response of President Bush, the response of Chertoff. But the deeper question uh, is, uh, you know, how prepared were we when Gustav was coming in contrast to Katrina? How far had we come? Um, let's go back to Katrina. Let me just read you here a, um, a description. Uh, we all are very familiar with this. The chaos and suffering in the wake of Katrina and the stunted response effort by the federal government as well as the Gulf area uh, state and local governments are well known. While a mass evacuation took place, the process began late and many refused to evacuate or had no means to leave the city. When state and local officials realized the potential of the storm, the response was one of hurry and panic. The components of response plan promised by FEMA during planning exercises in the years preceding the storm were woefully inadequate or non-existent. As the levees gave way and water flooded the city, there was a massive, unanticipated failure of regional communications and little ability to give guidance to the impacted citizenry or to coordinate the relief efforts or even to get a clear picture of the extent of the catastrophe. Citizens were cut off from the direction about appropriate measures and response agencies fell into disarray, including agencies like the New Orleans Police Force, which suffered widespread abandonment of duty by serving officers in the middle of spontaneous street violence. 
many, with many officers simply running away or actually participating in the looting and pandemonium. Co confusion reigned over issues such as supervision of the Superdome, et cetera, et cetera. So it was very chaotic. It was a human tragedy on, on one of the grandest scales we have seen. Um, in order to think about the response effort to Katrina, um, I want to talk about tac tactical competence. And I want to focus on um, some what I call basic capacities that are essential to tactical competence. So for thinking about the ability to make rational decisions, the ability to make coherent decisions, the ability to move effectively, to move the machinery of government effectively to address problems. Um, I want to talk about three basic capacities that are essential to the Bush administration or any administration's ability to respond um, in a crisis. The clarity of the mission, um, the issue in, in this case of privatization, and also the issue of hierarchy. And let me develop each of those. The clarity of mission. Um, we have to first ask, tactical competence for what? Uh, what do we mean by homeland security? What do we mean by, uh, what is the mission overall of DHS? This is an old debate in our government, uh, whether or not we should pursue an all-hazards approach or whether or not we should pursue a, an approach that is more divided, one that focuses on issues of civil defense, or what we might now call terrorism and responding to terrorism, and one that maybe focuses on emergency relief. Under the direction of James Lee Witt, under the Clinton administration with FEMA, we moved to an all-hazards response, meaning that all hazards have common things uh, common components to them, and we need to prepare for them, we need to respond to them, uh, we, we need to recover from them, uh, we need to mitigate possibilities of, of danger from them. And so we'll focus on those functions as opposed to focusing on here's how we respond to a hurricane, here's how we respond to a terrorist attack. Right? So the idea is to integrate those functions, that's an all hazards approach. Uh, DHS, when it was created, the Department of Homeland Security, was fundamentally focused on the issue of terrorism. It came out of 9-11, it was a response to the terrorist attack of 9-11, and the issues of all hazards, the issues of blending these components uh, were really pushed to the side. And you saw this in a variety of ways. Uh, FEMA had a, a lot of money taken away from it as an agency that it used for building these kinds of capacities at the state and local level, and instead they went to an Office of Domestic Preparedness, which was brought over from the Department of Justice to become part of DHS. Its focus was on weapons of mass destruction, helping state and local governments prepare for and respond to terrorist attacks using weapons of mass destruction. So the, the money that went to state and local governments, the focus was on uh, preventing and responding to terrorist attacks. It was a very important topic, but a lot of these broader emergency management issues were kind of pushed to the side. It also emphasized police departments over fire departments. So there was kind of a privileging of emergency responders as well um, that went along with this. There was also a kind of continuous reorganization within DHS to try to reflect this. That said, this issue has never fully been settled because the state and local governments will say, you know, what we really need is an all-hazards approach, and that's how we practice, that's how we think about this. So when we say competence for what, it is still a big question mark. That has not been resolved. The Bush administration has pushed for this more terrorism-oriented uh, ca capacity, but it is not resolved. So that's one huge capacity issue. If you're not clear about your mission, <laughs> it's very hard to build your capacities associated with it. Um, another component of, of the capacity with respect to emergency response deals with privatization, a, a, an ongoing trend in our government for many, many years. Um, but there are a couple of key uh, relevant components with respect to the Bush administration that I think we need to talk about. Joe Alba, who preceded Michael Brown as the director of FEMA, um, said in con congressional testimony in 2001 that he saw the uh, state and local government emergency relief programs as oversized entitlement programs and a disincentive to state and local risk management. In other words, that when FEMA comes to the rescue and the cavalry comes to the rescue, state and local governments no longer have an incentive to take the responsibility for their own mitigation and planning efforts. Um, that's a debatable claim. Uh, we, we will continuously debate where risk management responsibility <coughs> lies in our federal system, uh, but this is how the Bush administration saw it. Um, and so uh, there was a, a definite interest in trying to downsize this capacity at the federal level to kind of ship it out. And you see this in two, two different ways. One is that a lot of the agencies that were brought into DHS, when they were brought in, they were scaled back. So an example is the agency of, uh, it's called the Federal Protective Service. It's responsible for protecting federal um, uh, buildings and um, uh, sites 
Uh, they would, in, in the course of an emergency, they would be responsible for overseeing FEMA employees, making sure of their safety, the safety of the tents and locations, and these kinds of things. They were brought into DHS from the General Services Administration. They took a 20% cut in their budget and staff when they were brought in. When Katrina hit, they were sent to New Orleans to oversee, to secure the Hill Boggs building and a variety of other federal um, entities and to do their role. There weren't enough of them. There were only 30 of them on the ground. They were very vital. And so DHS contracted with Blackwater. You all are familiar with Blackwater, okay? Blackwater is the, um, the organization that provided security services in Iraq, right? So Blackwater comes in and doing the job that they've been trained for and that they're very capable of doing is debatable in Iraq. Uh, they were accused of being uh, excessively um, aggressive, uh, quite uh, rude and abusive in their efforts to protect and help in the recovery effort of Katrina. So you have this disconnect, um, wanting to privatize but not having the capacity there in order to provide that kind of privatization as well. You also had within FEMA, um, minimal numbers of employees who could actually oversee the contracts that were required to meet the Katrina relief effort. So there were 33 procurement uh, people on staff with FEMA. Um, there were 55 slots, so 22 that were not filled. And reports said that they needed as many as you know 100 or more. So those kinds of oversight positions were also not there. Another huge capacity issue. Um, another capacity issue is the hierarchy that is DHS. Uh, Don Kettle has written uh, many wonderful pieces on issues of contingent coordination and the challenges of Homeland Security that really require a very networked, kind of flexible matrix approach to coordinating and trying to address the issues of Homeland Security and emergency response. Charles Wise from Indiana has done the same. Um, DHS is exactly the opposite, right? We said, um, let's put it all together, you know, put it in a pyramid and, you know, slap DHS on it and call it done. Um, it is a very inflexible, uh, not, not a very capable kind of organization in terms of being able to address the challenges that it faces. A great example of this during Katrina is uh, a gentleman, uh, Mr. Doan, D-O-A-N, who worked for DHS. Uh, he was receiving phone calls from Walmart managers saying that the National Guard was uh, taking supplies from their stores. It was, they, they were accused of looting their stores. They were taking water and diapers and <coughs> baby formula and these kinds of things. And Doan knew that it was because they, they didn't have these supplies. They needed them. People needed these things. And so Doan said, wait a minute. Let's call it unusual procurement. And he worked out a deal with Walmart. He said, look, you guys provide the supply. We will ensure that you get paid. We'll cut you a check at the end of this, but we're going to tap into your capacity, your network, to provide the kind of services we need right now. And Walmart says, okay, we'll do it. So Walmart goes along with this. They, they were fantastic by most accounts. Walmart did a fantastic job. And in the end, when it came time to pay Walmart, the DHS hierarchy said, what were you thinking to promise this? You know, this is, this is so against our procurement rules and the kind of hierarchy and procedures that we have. We can't do this. And so Doan wrote a famous note which says, I did it, I'd do it again, and the president would back me up, and he resigned. Um, but it was a classic case of the kind of flexibility and kind of creative thinking that was needed at the time and the inability of this organization to support that. So again, a kind of, um, a kind of hierarchical clash. And I, I want to point out here, too, that DHS is not without this kind of capacity. There are a number of agencies inside DHS, such as the Coast Guard, that have wonderful flexibility and capacity. It's when you try to kind of coordinate them all together in the, under the umbrella of DHS that you have a problem. Now let me just, I wouldn't be doing my scholarly job here if I didn't point out that there are some items that may give us pause here in terms of how we criticize the Bush administration with respect to their response to Katrina. Katrina was a very big storm. <laughs> it was a, an enormous storm. Um, it's, it's not clear that anyone could have been totally prepared for this storm. So uh, we leave that as, as a big um, point. Another is that there's a great deal of research out there in the organizational theory literature which struggles with this question, the lessons we never learn. Why can't we do this better? You know, after every emergency, after every storm, we write an after action report and we say, you know, what did we do wrong? What do we need to do better? Da, 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 da. And we do the same thing, <laughs> we make the same mistakes over again. So there's a lot of literature about, uh, out there about the challenges that organizations have about learning, about the incentive to be more cautious, 
than to be more aggressive. Um, and this is a, an interesting theoretical literature which may give us pause in how we think about how the government is able to respond to these things. When you think about the incentives facing people in these organizations, it's a very tough set of challenges. Um, another second thought may be just the idea of uh, wicked problems, you know, that uh, the nature of this storm was, again, so, so huge that the capacity of government to deal with these evolving problems uh, just may not be there yet. So I, I set those out as caveats that we may want to put the, in the context of this um, broader picture. Let me move now to this notion of strategic management, the longer term impact of the Bush administration on homeland security. Um, and, and here I think there's, uh, there's a couple of things that the Bush administration has done uh, for good or for ill that, we, that will be with us for a while with respect to how we think of the field of homeland security. It was forged by the Bush administration in the, um, in the wake of 9-11. And so the terrorist attacks of 9-11 really defined this field, really defined the kind of bringing together of these organizations. Um, that in and of itself, in a world defined by incrementalism, uh, is going to have a long-term impact. Uh, so there is definite uh, scale and depth of the organization effort that will have an impact. There has also been a fundamental shift of resources from the kind of all hazards approach to much more of the terrorism, um, you know, preventing, especially the prevention part of terrorism, preventing, uh, preparing for and responding to terrorism. That shift in resources has been dramatic and will impact us for a long time. Uh, and, and therefore, I, I, under FEMA, we were building up those capacities at the state and local level as well as at the federal level. And I think that there has, there has grown a kind of disconnect between those relationships at the state and local level um, and the capacities that states had. It's a very much a fluid relationship that has to be maintained, and that has been um, impacted significantly. Okay, let me just say the bottom line here. Um, I would agree with a lot of the other comments that have, gone, that have been um, put out here today about a lack of commitment to capacity. There, there is just simply not much, there doesn't appear to be much interest in the capacity of emergency response, in the capacity of Homeland Security. There is a lot of symbolic benefit that comes from creating the Department of Homeland Security and the kinds of um, publicity that comes along with that, but there has just not been the long-term investment in capacity. Um, the creation of DHS, I would argue, was in part seen as an opportunity by the Bush administration to leverage some of its efforts to impact personnel reform. Right? We got a lot of, we got some major shifts you know, to pay banding and trying to do away with some of the basic civil service grades and things that came along with the Homeland Security legislation. Um, I, I also think that leadership was definitely missing in this instance. I have definitely focused on the organizational capacity issues, but leadership has everything to do with organizational capacity. Um, and whether they were just lackluster or worse, um, others have addressed that today, so I, I will leave it there. I will also say that I think um, this emergency management field more generally uh, is an illustration of a federalist philosophy with a bite. Uh, that there is you know, an effort to kind of devolve responsibilities to the state and local government without the kind of relationship building, resource sharing, uh, and kind of cooperation that I think is necessary, especially in the field of um, emergency response. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll add something quickly to Ann's paper that, that strikes me, having lived on the Gulf Coast for a while. Tom Lansford is somewhere out in the audience. He can probably talk about this too. It, it seems as if when we haven't had a major hurricane for a long time, we are very, very unprepared. <laughs> it, it, uh, a second thing I, I'd say, in some fairness to the Bush administration on this, and only some, um, uh, Abba's argument in part was looking at, at say, I, uh, I can't remember the name of the town in Iowa that keeps flooding. One town flooded five times in 10 years. We kept rebuilding it. There is some danger in an open-ended federal commitment. Now that doesn't mean they didn't take it a bit too far. <laughs> um, uh, a final thing that, that strikes me, I've always wished that Homeland Security could learn from the military, not that they do it that well, but it, the notion of jointness means that really you have to have people in different parts of the Department of Homeland Security serving in each other's agencies and promoted around. But during the Clinton administration, you couldn't make SES, which is the highest uh, career part of the government. Um, unless you had served in more than one agency or else served in state and local government. Uh, there was a very strong commitment to having people with a breadth of experience and, and that way you'd be better able to work with different organizations. So I'll, those are my quick comments, um, but I, I thought everybody did a great job. Let me turn it over to the audience. The Why is there so much um, 
antipathy, so much rank partisanship, quite frankly. Are we arguing about not you know, domestic policy, not that much to create, to create a difference, especially between the compassionate conservatives and the new Democrats? That's question number one. Why are you thinking about that? Question number two, about no child left behind. Can we maybe take the first question? Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> That's a big one. So, um, I mean, I would make a pretty quick answer. I think the hyper-partisanship that we identify, and certainly the media talks about incessantly, I think you're right to, to note this sort of disconnect between what seems like a sort of ideological um, convergence in some ways, a philosophical convergence, um, and yet a, a sort of the partisan kind of disconnect uh, when actually we talk about governance. And I think it has a lot to do with two things. Um, one, the way we draw our congressional districts, uh, and second, the way we do our primary process for selecting presidential candidates. And, and both of those processes tend to uh, nominate candidates who are, are more extreme. Uh, and I think that's, that's part of, a big part of the answer there. Um, yeah, and I, I'd just love to follow that on by, I often talk about the fact that I think that prior to Bill Clinton, um, what we actually had were the two parties fighting on what I considered to be a Jeffersonian spectrum. In the sense that the Democrats were moving along in um, a sense of, you know, sort of all men are created equal. And there was a, a sense of entitlement that went along with that. And the Republicans were going along on the other side of Jefferson, which is the state's rights and small government side. Um, and I believe that the new democratic philosophy was fundamentally, if you will, in this sort of classic old understanding of our arguments, a Hamiltonian shift. And I believe that um, there was a sense of an understanding energy and, um, in the government, but also efficiency. And so the New Democrats brought this in. One of the things that was absolutely clear to me as I was in the Department of Education, um, and we were looking at the By Lieberman bill, um, which um, did not move forward in the Senate because too many of the um, sort of liberal progressives in the Senate were unhappy with that bill. Um, Al Gore could not run on that in 2000. I mean, it basically came down to the fact that um, he could in some ways not pick up the new democratic philosophy, be, partly because of, of the commitment to the teachers union, partly because he had a competitive primary in New Hampshire, and he desperately needed the teachers unions behind him. And then I think um, what you saw was that actually George W. Bush, because he had been a governor in a state working with um, the Department of Education in making some of these reforms, picks up this compassionate conservatism. And now I actually think the parties are fighting on a Hamiltonian spectrum. So this is my question coming out of this 2008 election. Will the Republicans go back to Jefferson, or will they not? I would just um, add, um, my answer is not very grandiose, but I think that there's a big difference between um, ideas and governance, mm -hmm. and I think that a lot of the a lot of the um, differences, you know, where ideas may converge, that how we go about implementing those ideas and how we go about bringing them to fruition really uh, remains very contentious. I think in a lot of ways over issues of contracting, over issues of unions, over issues of decentralization versus centralization, over issues of state and local government cooperation. I think all those issues remain very contentious. Second question. Those are great answers. And the second question is about no child left behind. Now, I'm not an education policy expert, but I know that Bob Moranto is a big advocate for no child left behind. I suspect that you respect it, respect the law quite a bit. So my question is this. Um, with high stakes testing, what you focus the tests on, such as the uh, re uh, such as reading and mathematics, would seem to give incentives for schools not to teach as much social studies, fine arts, or science. And to me, it sounds very boring to have to just learn for, for, for high stakes tests. So can you give a defense of the child left behind for a, for a, holistic, uh, a holistic learning that just was, is actually testing? And also, it seems like there's different regulations for every state. So um, every state has different sorts of testing. So there doesn't seem to be that much consistency across the board. Let me, can I, if I can do that, or you can follow on. You, 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 you had to let states do their own tests, or it wouldn't have worked. I mean, there's no way politically you could do that. I love the arts, I love social studies, but if kids can't read and do basic math, they're screwed. And the bottom line is, an awful lot of kids are not learning to read and do basic math. And the, what No Child Left Behind do, does, I, I think, right now, it, um, it encourages us to move towards reforms that are getting more of the lower performing kids. It doesn't affect the upper performing kids much, 
get more of the lower performing kids up to where they're getting at least basic skills so they can compete not in the global economy but in the American economy. Um, and, and I visited a school just yesterday, in fact, that, that Neil knows about, that they love No Child Left Behind. They're an inner city school that does really well. Politically, they're not very popular because they're doing some things that are unusual. Uh, but because of No Child Left Behind, they can't be closed down. Without those measurements, they would get closed down like that because they do not have political friends. And, and just serving kids doesn't matter. But can I just add one thing to that, too? Because I think one of the things that I always believed about No Child Left Behind was um, that it was really much more of a measure that was intended to show that the emperor has no clothes. And, and what I mean by that is this is where I think it has been tremendously effective in exactly um, you know, what you said about the dialogue's changed now. Why has the dialogue changed? The dialogue has changed because prior to No Child Left Behind, nobody knew our schools were failing because everybody had a blue ribbon commission and everybody had all these different ways to say, you yeah, know, we're sending a lot of kids to college, everything's great. And really nothing was great. Um, when I looked at sort of a bird's eye view of education in 1999, when I got to the Department of Education, I, I was appalled and I was terrified. And um, I absolutely supported No Child Left Behind. I still support it because I think what it has done is that it has fundamentally gotten people to sort of hold these schools, their feet to the fire. Um, which they never really had before. And while there's still no consistency, we're starting to move down that dialogue road. Um, and I think that's important. Yeah, and just maybe to add two other things to it as well. I mean, I, you know, I, I support No Child Left Behind as a Democrat. Now, again, support No Child Left Behind <laughs> is sort of a weird thing to say because nobody's really for No Child Left Behind. Even the people who kind of like standards testing accountability aren't for No Child Left Behind, so it's sort of a false dichotomy. I mean, the law's got a lot of problems. Uh, even the people who think that its general thrusts are kind of in the right direction acknowledge it has a lot of problems, particularly around um, the testing and, and, you know, just for starters, you know, uh, you, we need to shift to a growth model that looks at individual students across time rather than cohorts, all the rest. Um, and, and nobody, and the second point is, you know, nobody likes standardized tests in, a, in an ideal situation. You don't, you don't base an accountability system along uh, or an education system along standardized tests. The problem is, you know, in the United States, uh, educational achievement and educational opportunity remain very highly correlated with race and class. And that is just morally reprehensible. And I think, um, you know, reformers on both the left and the right, really that is the fundamental point that's driving all of this. Yes, there's a lot of political machinations, you know, on both sides as to how you sort of, you know, use that and play on that and build systems and reforms around that. But I think that's the real driver. And I think that's why the civil rights groups uh, have really come, come to support um, this, even as a lot of these policies are being characterized as Bush policies or conservative policies um, and all the rest. And I think, you know, standardized tests are very problematic and they do have some unintended consequences. On the other hand, I agree with, with Bob, you can't compare kind of the ideal education we'd like kids to see and then criticize NCLB for denying that ideal to, to kids in, in urban cities because believe me, the kids in the urban areas have not been getting anything approximating the ideal education and even in the absence of NCLB, uh, you know, they were not, they would not be. Um, so we have to kind of talk about the reality. Um, and, and I think standardized tests ultimately from a policy level um, really are the only way that you can, you know, measure progress uh, of students um, and schools and districts and states and compare them. Um, and that's just the fundamental, I think, reality to that. And, yeah, you know, no, no, nobody likes standardized tests. Nobody likes their auditor or accountant either, but I don't know a better and, way. And also, most people don't realize that actually one of the, the largest drivers toward diversifying the Ivy Leagues were the SAT. So it's, it's important to understand that, you know, once those um, sort of traditions of what is a good student breaks down, then that standardization, even if it's a poor measure, has some sense of demonstrating and offering more equality of opportunity. Let me, let me turn it over to Bill. Bill Boston. Well, a couple of comments and, and questions. Uh, when I was in the White House, I was the point on uh, Goals 2000 and EASA, so I can speak with some authority there, but I won't, because there is, there is a time. Suffice it to say uh, that the, you know, that the uh, uh, lie quit at the time you know, with regard to national standards was that the Republicans were closer because they were national and the Democrats because they were standards. I don't think the politics has fundamentally changed. I spent four days a few months ago with George Miller and a group of Democrats, uh, and I can tell you, they said to a man and a woman, George, we followed you. 
2001. We will never follow you down that road again. So, you know, I think that the path to a reauthorization of anything like NCLB is going to be a very hard one. And, you know, the default democratic position will be opposition, period. Uh, with regard to with regard to Jeremy's question about New Democrats and National Conservatives, it's a lot simpler than the answer you got. Uh, the New Democratic philosophy was embraced by a presidential candidate but rejected by a majority of his party. Likewise, their compassion was in the And that's why there was no, you know, there was no sense of the whole. I mean, they both were outliers in their respective parties, and they couldn't, they couldn't bring their, their depression delegations along with them, except by brute force and temporarily. Okay, now here, you know, you know, here's, here's my question for Ann, actually, actually two questions. Uh, number one, a, you know, you know, a frequent co-author of mine, Wayne Kmart, predicted at the time DHS was created that dragging FEMA into it would be a catastrophe for emergency preparedness, and, and I think the events have borne out. Everything you said reinforced the view that FEMA is never going to be healthy again unless it becomes independent again. I'd like to comment on that. Here's my second question. I noticed in your file that your first two books were entitled, number one, the SEC and Capital Market Regulations, and number two, checking on banks, autonomy and accountability in three federal agencies. I wonder if you would comment on the Bush administration's record of financial <laughs> Uh, first on FEMA, um, I, I, I think it depends on who's at the top of DHS with respect to FEMA's health right now. I mean, I think, I think leadership in FEMA is going to make all the difference in the world. And I also think clarifying this no notion of mission, if, if DHS truly embraced an all-hazards mission and had leadership inside FEMA to accomplish that, I think it would be okay. Um, there are a number of very powerful, strong agencies within DHS. Uh, the Coast Guard has a long history, of course, that it brings with it to DHS, but it's a, it's a model agency of collaboration and coordination and relief and response. Uh, and I think, you know, James Lee Witt, we hear a lot about him, but he was phenomenal in what he was able to achieve with that agency, uh, both politically and in terms of its capacity. And to go back to Bob's earlier point, in working with the states to really make the states and local governments more responsible for the kinds of risk management things. So, so he took a very big picture approach, and I think that's what's missing in FEMA right now, wherever it's located, is this kind of you know, mission approach, a kind of sense of what its capacities actually are. I think that's another problem, too, is that we expect FEMA to be more than it actually has the capacity to be. You know, FEMA is really a facilitator of emergency relief. It's really there to help state and local governments re respond and react, and it's not the entire cavalry. So I think there's there has to be a kind of reality check, a kind of capacity clarification, and I think that can happen whether it's inside or outside. It depends if it has the political support for that. Um, with respect to the financial crisis, <laughs> wow. Um, I will just say that watching uh, Henry Paulson stand in front of a room full of reporters uh, and say that he will not apologize for shifting uh, his position on how to spend $300 billion worth of TARP money that was supposed to purchase, uh, be used to purchase assets, but now uh, is going to be, has been used to purchase tier one stocks uh, and in a variety of companies. Um, it, it's, it, it, is, it is fundamentally changing the way we think about the relationship between government and the private sector, what we think of public governance. I think all of these things are just changing like silly putty every day right now with all the, what does it mean, you know, that the Fed owns AIG now? You know, what does that mean? How, how will the Fed not be owning AIG? You know, there are all these questions. We've moved into this whole new world now um, in an effort to respond, to stop the bleeding of the markets, to stabilize the markets. But I don't think we've given any consideration whatsoever to where we're going and what, you know, what the future needs to be. What, what does the regulatory regime of the future look like? And I think that's an issue for the Obama administration to engage in right now, but right now we're doing a lot of very short-term kind of ad hoc responses that are fundamentally changing the way that we're going to govern the longer term, I think. So we really need, I, I think, as a public administration scholar, I think these are big public administration questions that we really need to be engaged in right now. And um, the economists and the journalists are really uh, capturing the debate, and that's great, but I think there's, we need to come in and start thinking about principles, design, method, and management, and we're just not addressing those at all.
Well, and I think to put a little bit of a finer point on it, it was Bill Clinton who said famously that the era of big government is over. <laughs> it may have been a little premature uh, in retrospect, and I think whether you're looking at education, you're mm -hmm. looking at mm -hmm. homeland security, you're looking at financial markets, um, we're, we're big government's back, um, and we have to think a little bit about what that means, um, not just for, for philosophies of governance and ideology, but also I think one of the themes that we all hit on um, is really what it means for federalism and sort of intergovernmental relations, and that's very much still an open story. I, I think that is a great note, um, and it's a note on which we'll close. We'll